This video covers Learning Objective 8.3 for PSY 235 Social Psychology. In this part of the chapter, we'll be studying how normative social influence can convince us to conform, uh, even with very, very little thought. So first, let's talk about what social psychologists mean by normative social influence. That requires that we think about what social norms are. Social norms are basically rules. They're either uh, implied that we learn through experience or they're very explicit. Um, and these are rules that can be within small groups, within large groups. You have norms that are expected in your family. You have norms that are expected within your friend groups. There are norms expected of us in online groups, as well as in institutions and other larger social contexts. Um, an example, a real simple example of a social norm that you experience pretty much every day is when you walk um, up and down stairs, which side of the stairway are you normally expected to be on? Now in, in US culture, the normative expectation is that you stay on the right-hand side. That's where we drive. We drive on the right-hand side of the road. That's a law. That's an explicit norm. Um, we, when we're walking though, the on sidewalks, up and down stairways, there is kind of an expectation that you be on the right-hand side. So that's a norm that's social. Um, test it out, go into a busy stairway and walk intentionally on the wrong side, walk on the left side and see what people do. They will often get kind of mildly confused by you or occasionally annoyed. So that's what social norms are. Normative social influence then is the the way in which these norms these expectations shape our behavior due to the fact that we prefer to not be disliked by groups that matter to us um, and, and you know the the studies that we're going to be talking about in this section of the chapter are really going to show how researchers have investigated this phenomenon and what its limits are so this type of conformity normative social influence in typically results in what's called public compliance. And that means you're in the social setting, in your head, like you're you're walking on the right-hand side of the stairway. Um, you, in your head, you may say to yourself, there's actually no logical reason for me to have to walk on the right side. We could all just sort of say, let's walk whatever way we want, um, but we comply. Um, we could disagree with it, but we'll comply. Um, Typically, you're not going to form an internal belief that says walking on the right-hand side of the stairs is an absolutely value is a value that I have, and I will not deviate from that. So that would be private acceptance. Um, now there are lots of other kinds of normative social influence, and we're going to explore some of those as we go forward here that really involve you conforming your behavior to do something illogical, irrational, but you do it anyway. And the question becomes, why? So we're going to start with looking at Solomon Ash's classic research study. This is a, uh, I believe that this footage is a recre recreation of the original study, but it was filmed, <laughs> you'll tell by the, the clothing, it was filled, filmed quite a long time ago and has some vintage uh, 70s garb going on. Well, an experiment is not a public opinion poll. It examines behavior under the pressure of social forces, as the experiment of Solomon Ash reveals. The experiment you'll be taking part in today involves the perception of length of lines. As you can see here, I have a number of cards, and on each card there are several lines. Your task is a very simple one. You're to look at the line on the left and determine which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. All right, we'll proceed in this order. Only one of the people in the group is a real subject, the fifth person with a white t-shirt. The others are confederates of the experimenter and have been told to give wrong answers on some of the trials. The experiment begins uneventfully as subjects give their judgments. Two, 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 two. three, 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 three. But on the third trial, something happens. Two. 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 The 
subject denies the evidence of his own eyes and yields to group influence. What? Ash found subjects went along with the group on 37% of the critical trials. But he found through interviews that they went along with the group for different reasons. What? What? They must be right. There are four of them and one of me. What? This subject's yielding is based on a distortion of his judgment. He genuinely believes that the group is correct. One. What? One. Two. One. Two. 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 I know they're wrong, but why should I make waves? Two. In this case, the subject knows he is right, but goes along to avoid the discomfort of disagreeing with the group. Here, the distortion is at the level of his response. Two. 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 In the previous experiment, the naive subject stood alone against the group. In this variation, Ash gave the naive subject a partner, here seated in the third position, who also gives the correct response. One. One. Two. Yielding drops to only 5% of the critical trials compared to 37% without a partner. Although subjects report warmth and good feeling toward the partner, they typically deny that he played a role in their own independence. The partnership variation shows that much of the power of the group came not merely from its numbers, but from the unanimity of its opposition. When that unanimity is punctured, the group's power is greatly reduced. Sometimes we go along with a group because what they say convinces us they are right. This is called informational conformity. But sometimes we conform because we are apprehensive that the group will disapprove if we are deviant. This is called normative conformity. The strength of the normative factor is shown in another variation carried out by Ash. In this variation, the subject is told that because he had arrived late, he would have to write his answers. Subjects in this private response experiment are exposed to the same amount of misleading information as other subjects, but they are immune from any possible criticism by the group. What? 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 And this enormously reduces the pressure to conform. Conformity drops by two-thirds. Ash's experiment is a classic. It reveals how people will deny what they see and submit to group pressure. It allows us not only to observe conformity, but to study the conditions that increase or reduce its occurrence. So some key takeaways there. First, you notice that in this experiment, both informational social influence and normative social influence are in play. So we talked about informational social influence in the last section of the, the chapter. Some of the participants, which you know Ash was able to, to discern this by asking participants why they decided to conform when they did. And some of them said, I must have just not understood what was going on, so I went along with the group. Um, that would be an informational social influence effect. Now, for most of them, they gave the reason of not wanting to rock the boat, of saying, you know, the rest of the group is doing this. I don't have the energy to fight it. I'm just going to go along with the group. At the same time, and this is the other take-home message, um, the vast majority of participants, like 76%, conformed at least once. Now flip that over and think about it in a different way. They conformed at least once. Remember that about 24% of the participants never conformed at all, period. So when you, you look at this, this table here, or this figure rather, a significant percentage never conformed at all. So they stuck to their own perception. They gave correct answers every single time. They didn't conform with the group. A big chunk felt the normative pressure and conformed at least once. Um, smaller percentages conformed a lot more. So it's important that you look at these findings and you say human you avoid saying human beings are just complete um 
conformists, they will conform to anything as long as there's a unanimous group facing them. It's important to acknowledge that people, a significant percentage of people are willing to stick to their own perceptions and give correct answers. But there is normative pressure involved and it can encourage us to give in to that normative pr pressure at least a small number of times. Now to think about the various reasons, and some of these were covered in the video, there are a variety of normative reasons for conforming. Um, one of them is that you may be influenced at first by questioning your own perceptions of the task, um, questioning the correctness of your own perceptions, and the sense of confusion that that creates can uh, encourage people then to look to others for what the normative response should be. So in this first bullet point, it's that combination of both informational and normative um, uh, conformity that's in play. Next is thinking about the fact that publicly complying doesn't really cost us a lot, especially if we perceive, hey, I'm in the face of this unanimous majority. I'd rather not you know, cause anyone to question me. I'd rather just go with the flow and not worry about it. And then if you ask people later, you know, what were the right answers? They, they know what the right answers were. And in fact, in another variation of the ASH design, if you bring subjects in after they've conformed, at least on a few of the trials in the face of a unanimous majority, if you bring them in by themselves, they will give the right answer every single time. Or if you allow them to give their judgments privately on paper, as you saw in the video, the compliance rate goes way down. So what that shows is that it's a public compliance effect. You're not transforming people's um, perceptions. Now remember back to the discussion of informational social influence, there was private acceptance or a change in the way people were perceiving things when they were faced with a very ambiguous task and there's no correct answer. This situation is different. You have a very clear, objectively correct answer, but you're faced with a unanimous majority. There are consequences for resisting normative influence. And one of the things that that Ash did and other researchers have done as well is to, to demonstrate what happens when we don't conform. So if you disregard the norms of your group, you've had this experience, maybe you wanted to, to buck the system, we tend to um, face some backlash for doing that. And it takes different forms if you violate the norms of your group. So the first thing that, that tends to happen is that the group will try and educate you. They'll try to talk to you, explain to you what you've done wrong, try to encourage you to come back into the system and give the right kind of responses. If that doesn't work, then they will go back to the playground and um, criticize you, laugh at you, withdraw from you, um, all of those fun things. So, um, it's important to remember, you know, what the consequences of being deviant really are. Um, go back to your eighth grade self, your seventh grade self, and think about what happened in your social groups when people tried to go against the, impl the implicit and sometimes explicit norms of the group. We tend to be very hostile with each other when we do that. So, uh, Think about that as you're you're kind of incorporating this knowledge in this this section of the chapter. So let's go back to you know normative social influence is really mostly about um, the issue of fitting in to a group that you want to be a part of. But we also have to think about the importance of being or feeling accurate um, because that's a part of this issue as well. When research subjects in kind of the ASH paradigm are given information about the importance of being right, does that help them to withstand the group pressure? Well, it depends. When, when importance is low, conformity to the group remains basically the same as it is 
uh, have been, has been documented in the ASH research. So if the importance of the task is low, you're, you don't have any motivation to encourage low conformity. If importance is high though, like if subjects are encouraged to believe that doing well on the task is actually going to have some payoff for them outside of the context, then conformity goes down, but it still happens at least some of the time. So even when the group is wrong, the, the normative pressure can actually interfere with our um, ability to, to focus in on the importance of accuracy. Um, I think that's an important message here is that human beings are very, very social creatures. We're very um, attuned to the degree to which we are valued by our group and we are accepted by our group. So we tend to, to pay attention to the the balance between importance and normative conformity if something is if the stakes are very very high there it doesn't erase the normative pressure we still have the normative pressure and it reduces our level of conformity but we still feel pulled in the direction of um, remaining uh, a part of the group so we will conform part of the time or we will conform partially so let's review when will people uh, conform to normative conformity. Well, one theory that is connected to this is something called social impact theory, um, which the idea is that social influence is going to depend on, on some specified factors. And this research comes from Latin A's work in the 80s. The first is how strong is the group uh, in terms of its importance to us? If a group and staying a member of the group is very important, that's going to have more conformity pressure. If the group is right there, they're immediate, they'll have more power. Um, and the number of the group mat of people in the group matters. So let's look at each of these separately. First, importance of the group. Normative pressure is going to be much stronger if there are bonds of friendship, if there are bonds of of love and respect and the costs of losing those things the friendship the love the respect if the cost is very high so you may feel more normative pressure with people to whom your connection is important to you and losing them would hurt you then we feel more compelled to um, normatively comply this also is related to how cohesive the group is when Groups are tight when they are highly cohesive in terms of their values expressions, their attitude expressions, um, and there, there are a lot of group norms about not betraying that cohesion. That tends to put more normative pressure on us to be compliant. When you know, another a part of this is, you know, the, the fact that you may have no allies in the group or you may perceive that you have no allies in the group. And in part, this is a cohesion effect, um, and it is related to the importance of the group to us. If we don't see that there's any other person within a group that we value who sees things the way we do, so another person who has a dissenting view, it can be really hard for you to stick to your guns and really push your, your own line of reasoning with the group. And this was seen in the video that I showed you. Um, Ash did his variation when he added a partner in deviance, um, conformity rates went down because the subject was no longer alone. Um, it, it led to a precipitous drop in conformity. So it dropped from, it dropped to 60% in comparison to 32% of trials. Now, in terms of group size, um, the Ash did some of this work, and then other researchers later found similar things. What they found is that conformity in increases generally as the number of people in the group increases, but it tends to plateau. So once the group size reaches four or five, you don't get much of an added benefit to increasing the size of the group beyond that. Um, so if it's just one person, conformity isn't as, as powerful an effect. If it's two people, 
not as powerful, but it's getting a little more. Three, a little added benefit. Four, five, that's the plateau point. You don't get much of an increase in conformity after you increase, increase group size beyond that. So what are some things that you can do to resist normative social influence? Because we're all vulnerable to it. Sometimes the costs are very low um, and you're not even motivated to resist normative social influence, but sometimes the cost is high. So what are some things that you can do to resist it? You can be aware that it's there and that it's functioning. When we are more aware, like if, if research subjects are given some basic information on how normative social influence works, they tend to be a little more um, resistant to normative conformity. You can also kind of, if you know that it's functioning, you can encourage yourself to take action to, um, like in, in a group context, if you know normative social pressure is a possibility, you can encourage the group to be aware and to take steps to interfere with normative social pressure. You can also, if you're in a group where there's a high degree of normative um, uh, pressure, um, you can seek out, actively seek out an ally. You can ask individuals outside the group context what their opinions are and engage them in conversation. Once you've had those conversations, it becomes easier in the group conversation to, you know, once you've pierced that bubble, to have more opinions and more ideas uh, exposed. Also, if you are a long-term member of a group and you have been a good participant in that group, meaning you've conformed most of the time, that tends to give you more latitude. It means that you can, you can occasionally violate the norms of the group without a lot of consequence. What these are called is, um, in Hollander's research, they're called idiosyncrasy credits. You get to deviate without a lot of consequences if you've been a good member of the group most of the time. So if you have enough of those idiosyncrasy credits, um, you can avoid some of the retribution. You can also, if you've been a good, solid member of the group, following the norms, it gives you more ability to take action to question the norms of the group um, in various sections. Like if you're a low credibility member of a group, you taking trying to take action to change the direction the group is going is a low success uh, likelihood. If, however, you have a lot of idiosyncrasy credits earned, you've been a long-term member of the group, that increases your credibility and increases the likelihood that you can take successful action to move a group in a more positive direction. Let's uh, review um, to conclude this section of the lecture. Informational versus normative social influence, and let's compare the Sharif classic study and the Ash study. In Sharif study, you were it was mostly focused on informational social influence. You have a difficult task, it's an ambiguous task. There's no correct answer to the, the questions that are being asked. What In those kinds of situations, we tend to look to others to, to form our own opinion of what the quote unquote correct answer might be. And then we tend to persuade ourselves, meaning we internalize the type of response we've given. And then we tend to continue to use that response even when making independent judgments later. In normative social influence, these are situations where there's a pretty clear, uh, easy task to do. It's not ambiguous at all. There is a correct answer, and you're pretty sure what that correct answer is. In those situations, your own beliefs about reality are in conflict with those of the group. Um, if you conform, it's because of the desire to be perceived as uh, normatively going along with the group. Internally, if you're given a chance to make those same judgments at a later point in time, you're going to go with your own beliefs rather than going with the previous judgments of the group. So what you're showing there is public compliance, but not private acceptance. And that concludes my coverage of Learning Objective 8.3.